Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Josh and Jason Money Christian and Conspiracy Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Monday. If you don't know me, I'm a Christian rapper, devoted husband, father, and army veteran. And my co-host will not be with me today. He's uh, actually working. Um, shout out to Jason. Thank you for uh, everything you do, bro. Um, and today we have an amazing guest, uh, Rich Tidwell. And uh, I, I heard about this brother uh, through Instagram, uh, started, started watching some of his sermons, and, uh, you know, started just finding out that he he knows the truth, man. And I love it, man. And uh, it, like you said, it's all Holy and Spirit inspired. Um, but I just wanted to have a, a great uh, biblical cosmology show with him and kind of put a microscope on some of the verses that that um, that you guys usually hear us go over. So, Rich, good morning. How you doing? Good morning. Glad to be here, Josh. Thanks very much for having me on the show. And those of you joining us for the live uh, podcast, I really appreciate you guys being here and had such a really positive outpouring from the, you know, biblical cosmology and flat earth community uh, after releasing my first full sermon on the topic. So I, I had spoken about cosmology, you know, within other sermons briefly. Um, and then, you know, the Holy Spirit had led me to do a full sermon on the topic and, and trying to be as comprehensive as possible. I know that I may not have, you know, uh, turned over every leaf, but we definitely dove in and gave people a good starting point. And one of the most encouraging things that I've been hearing is people who, when the Holy Spirit reveals to them how cosmology actually works, they're relieved rather than stressed out. You know, they're they're excited about the fact that everything the Bible says is true, and it actually adds validity to all the other words that are in Scripture. So if Genesis one starts with how things work, how they were created. Well, by the time you're in Genesis 3, you believe that as well. You know, if you know there's a rakia over you, then you know there's a serpent here deceiving, Nashan, Hebrew, uh, and you know that uh, the whole problem down here is unbelief and lies and all of that. And so God delivers us by telling us the truth, giving us Jesus, his Messiah, which the first promise of the Messiah is in Genesis 3. And and so what I've noticed is when people come to believe the cosmological arguments that are presented in the Bible, uh, they that cascades into believing the rest of the Bible, which go figure, you know, God puts cosmology in chapter one. If you believe chapter one, you'll probably end up believing the rest. And so uh, it seems that in his infinite wisdom, he knows exactly what he's doing. We simply have to listen. Yes, I agree. And uh, it's it's interesting because you did say that right there, you know, beguiled in Genesis 3.13. Uh, if you guys just go to your strong coordinates and look up that word, it is spelled N-A-S-A. So I think that's really interesting. Sometimes I, I do that with um, friends. I tell them, um, go to Genesis 3.13, go to your strong coordinates and click this word real quick. You know, just just because they know they know my my thought, my my train of thought whenever I'm doing, you know, sermons sometimes and and uh, he was like, they're like, okay, wow, NASA. Okay, wow. They say it out loud, NASA. And that's what everybody knows NASA by is not, exactly. they don't know National yeah. Aeronautics Space Agency. So I think that was interesting. And also right there when Eve got to be, gets beguiled and then all of a sudden Genesis 3.15. So that's Genesis 3.13, then Genesis 3.15, who's mentioned the Messiah. So I love that, dude. And then yeah. you go, then you go back and, uh, and like you said, man, the firmament, all this stuff is creation. Uh, a lot of people try to tell me, well, the Bible's not a science book. And it's like, well, what is what is cosmology? It's the study of the heavens, right? So, right away we get that cosmology. Then we get, you know, we get we get biology by you know everything being created. Then we have all these different things, you know, taxonomy. Whenever Adam's naming the animals, there's all these different science things that are happening at that moment. Yep. And it's up to us to to believe God's word or man's word, right? We let God be true, every man a liar. That's just part of the uh, of of what we need to do in the Bible or what we need to do in life. So. And another thing we need to understand is um, the model that 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 that's the current model for our solar system, which soul is actually a god as well, but is heliocentric. So helios is a uh, in the Greek religion is the sun god, sometimes called a titan. What is a titan? Well, a titan is is the Greeks' uh, stolen version of a nephilim. What is the Nephilim? Well, if you read the book of Enoch, I'm not saying it's scripture, but it is history, historical. Nephilim is a spirit demon. So Helios, uh, it's basically saying it's a it's a uh, it's a sun god centered solar system, right? So I think people need to understand that that they're that even in the words, if they're not paying homage to our God Yahweh, they're not paying they're not paying homage to Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit. They're paying homage to Helios, 
the Greek sun god every time that they they mention these planets, you know, orbiting and all this stuff. So people need to understand. Yeah, I, I, I think that brings up a, another good point in Genesis three is that we're presented with our creator, the true creator uh, in Genesis one, and then the deceiver, uh, the creature uh, in Genesis three. And the two are diametrically opposed. Uh, the father of heavenly lights tells only the truth. Every word that comes out of his mouth is truth. Uh, whereas, and Jesus makes this very clear in the Gospels, but the creature, the serpent, as we know, Satan, um, he only lies. He's, he's a deceiver. And our fundamental problem is unbelief. Most people think our fundamental problem is sin. Sin, in fact, with the Messiah, sin is truly not an issue. I mean, all sin has been born by the Messiah. So why are people not saved? It's it's not because of sin. It's because of unbelief, which is actually the first sin. That's the true sin. Um, and what I mean by that is that, of course, we're, you know, we're dead in our sins, everything that the scriptures say. However, uh, Eve's problem right at the beginning was that she didn't believe what God had said about the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then Adam followed along with her and stopped believing um, and instead believed what the serpent had said when he said, well, you'll be like God. You know, that really interested humanity. Oh, I can be God instead. And that's that's Satan's whole kingdom. And so there's the father of lies and there's the father of lights. These are the two fathers that are down here. And essentially, if you are believing what the father of creation or the father of heavenly lights uh, has said, then you will be saved because you'll believe about the Messiah. You'll believe about all the promises. You'll believe uh, everything. And if you do not believe the father uh, of the true father of creation, our heavenly father, then your other father is going to by default be your father, which is the serpent. And most people don't realize this, but the scriptures say that he has uh, led unbelievers captive to do his will. Well, how does he make them captive to do his will? By unbelief. And you see that right at the beginning. Genesis 3, that conflict that's occurring is all of humankind's conflict it wasn't just for the garden of eden you're born into the exact same conflict you're contending with the exact same serpent and he's saying essentially the exact same lies and one of the first lies he starts to tell us is that cosmology uh in the bible is not true right because that's the first page of the bible so you get to you know genesis 1 telling you that there were waters separated from waters and that god put a solid rakia between the two um the first thing that the devil's going to do is begin lying and telling us no that's not what that means we're just going to call that an expanse that's just the you know that's just talking about the atmosphere above your head what have you not a solid dome over us but then when you start to do that, you know, Noah's flood doesn't make sense. Um, Jesus's return where the whole earth will see him doesn't make sense. You know, the scripture is talking about God's throne being directly above the firmament and that the earth is his footstool and all of these things start to not make sense. And so because you deny one of the first verses of the Bible, the rest of the Bible starts to unravel. And this is exactly how the serpent works. He takes God's word. He lies about it. And then he tries to, and usually successfully does, unravel the rest. And so our duty as mankind is to come back to belief, to literally believing the word of God. And that's what Romans 10, 17 says. It says faith comes by hearing and hearing continually the word of Christ or the anointed word or the word of God, depending on how you translate it. Yeah, and, and is the devil's job to take away your faith? And also what kind of faith is being produced when you hear the word of God? yet do not believe it right so when right. you start what happens is he takes genesis puts it in a blender and he and he makes people instead of once they learn this scientific view then they start reading the bible what happens is it they basically they make everything an allegory or poetry or this must not be true cannot be true because of this so i'm going to place it in a section of 30 percent unbelief and then i only believe the part about salvation and all this other part that's important maybe yeah. only the new testament but everything yeah. is like a foundation building as you go through Genesis. It's, it's already mentioning, you know, it mentions this first, but it does mention the Messiah. Jesus is through every single page. And he's actually there in First Colossians 1.15. Everything's created by him, through him, for him. So we, we got to understand this stuff. It's very important. Also, he says faith comes by hearing the word of God. That's that's very important. Also, it is impossible to 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 please God without faith. So we right. got to understand Hebrews eleven six. It's impossible to please God without faith. 
Now, what's what's happening? So if faith comes by hearing the word of God and, and you're not believing it, then it's impossible to please God, right? So we got to make right. sure we know that. Also, like you said, Titus 1-2, um, God is, uh, you know, it's impossible for, well, impossible for God to lie in Hebrews. It says that. Also, it says that God cannot lie in, hide it, in, in Titus t, uh, Titus 1-2. So we got to understand that. All scriptures inspired by God as well. So uh, all scriptures inspired by by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. So when you're talking about the devil coming in, changing, uh, you know, the cosmology, what he's doing is he's creating a doctrine out of it, even though people don't know that that's what he's doing. Right. So when you go to right. the scripture, it's, it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction of people that are giving you the wrong doctrine. So when you go to the scripture, you start reading and you read it literally word for word for what it says, you, you know that the doctrine must be going the wrong way when it doesn't agree with what, what the Bible says word for word. The doc, It's creating a doctrine, even though people don't know that scientism is definitely a doctrine and and it's not from the Bible at all. You know, right. some of it, some of it is, some of it is okay. You know, the stuff that's not pseudoscience, like the stuff we're going to be going over today. So, yeah, yeah. Well, and I'd love to, <clears throat> if, uh, if you'd like to begin, I'd, I'd love to read from Romans 1, because that's essentially what we're talking about is this unbelief. And he invokes cosmology. So this is one of my, uh, when I'm talking about cosmology, I think Genesis 1, Ezekiel 1, and Romans 1 are really uh, fundamental uh, chapters to become familiar with, uh, among many others. But um, if we pick up from verse 16, I'm reading from an NASB uh, 2020, one of the newer versions of the NASB. It says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so belief is the fundamental issue here. In fact, in the Gospels, Jesus is asked, um, you know, what are the works that God requires? What must we do to do the works of God? And Jesus responds, the work of God is this, to believe the one or believe in him whom he has sent. So believing in the Messiah, believing what he has said, believing what he has done. And what he's done according to Isaiah 53 is he has bore in verses 4, and five, he has bore sickness, pain, sin, and death on the cross. And you'll hear this quoted often in scripture. They'll say, and by his wounds, we were healed. And so that, that is the gospel message that Jesus came and he bore sin and the effects of sin. So we there was no sickness or death in, in the earth when God created everything. So you have sin. Sin, the first sin is actually unbelief, which is why belief is the cure for the problem. So you have sin, and then you have people getting sick and weak. The body starts to shut down, and then you have death. And this is all the result of that serpent coming and deceiving us. And I remember something that Jesus says in the Gospels that is really important to understand and why God wants us to know his creation. Uh, one, his creation shows us that he loves us, that he cares about us, that he designed everything for us, that he's kind to both the believers and unbelievers here within this terrarium, this realm that he's created, um, and two, that we're all valuable to him. Jesus said in the gospel narrative, he said, you know, if one of you has a sheep that falls into a pit on the Sabbath day, would you not reach in and, and pull him out? And he said, how much more valuable is a man than a sheep? In other words, we've fallen into this pit, and Jesus is eager, and the Father through the Son is eager to save us. And so that's the power of the gospel is coming to believe that truth, that this is what uh, God wants for us. He wants us to enjoy the Garden of Eden without all this unbelief, sin, and death affecting us. That's what he created us for, fellowship with him and enjoying the creation that he made for us. And so Amen. it continues on, verse 17, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith and is written, as it is written, but the righteous one will live by faith. And that's quoting Habakkuk. So <clears throat> you are righteous in God's kingdom by believing what God has said. That's, that's literally what this comes down to. In the beginning, Adam and Eve stopped believing what God said and started believing what the serpent said. This is our entire problem. All of humanity, this is our issue. And so our duty is to come back to believing. And how do we believe? As Josh and I were saying, you must hear the word of God continually and maybe you've never heard the word of God regarding cosmology. You're coming across this video. You know, you wanted to see what some Christians had to say about it. Well, this, this is 
this is the whole point of, of what the scriptures present to us. We've got to believe what's said, whether it's cosmology, whether it's the gospel, Jesus coming, uh, you know, whether it's on sex and marriage, whether it's on money, you know, it doesn't really matter what the topic is. It's all true in the scriptures. And we're starting off on the wrong foot if we don't believe the first page of the Bible. In other words, if the first page of the Bible says that earth was made first <clears throat> before before the sun, that's already calling into question how the earth could be chasing after the sun. Because there's nothing that says that and then God set the earth in motion to chase after the sun. There's, there's nothing like that. So we're already off to a bad start on the worldly cosmology right from page one, because instead it says, well, God made this solid rakia, this dome over the earth, and that it separates waters above from waters below, and that he set the sun inside of the firmament, and that it literally circuits the earth inside of it. And so we're, we're already into a whole different belief system. So the righteous will live by faith. That statement, what that means is, all of us are unworthy. We're not actually worthy of God's goodness. We're not worthy of this. This is God's charity poured out on his creation because he recognizes we've been deceived by a serpent. Like we talked about earlier already in Genesis 3, that word in Hebrew is spelled N-A-S-A -A for beguiled or deceived. It's pronounced nasha. And, and, and there's no denying that, that these deceivers still use the same acronyms and words and all of that. In fact, I, you, you probably know this, Josh, uh, but our viewers may not, that, you know, meta uh, is also a Hebrew word. And of course, Facebook adopted that. And meta is this Hebrew word for death, right? And NASA is this Hebrew word for nasha, this Hebrew word for deceive. I mean, they love using these biblical terms and putting it in your face and not like laugh. They laugh at you while not telling you the truth. So it really is uh, a bummer. Okay, so verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. Now pay attention to verse 20. This is really important. So God's wrath is revealed. What, what, what is God's wrath? God's wrath is more so that he hands you over to Satan, your own belief system, uh, rather than anything else. Many times people think that God's wrath is uh, him, you know, directly striking people. And actually the way the scriptures indicated is he gives you over to your own desires. In fact, the rest of Romans one starts to say that God gave them over. God gave them over. God gave them over at least three times. And what that means is if you want to make Satan your father, you can have him as your father. And what I will do is I will pursue you without violating that choice. And, and this is a huge fundamental understanding of what the wrath of God is. So God loves you genuinely and then his wrath is he hands you over to your own beliefs your own thought process you want satan you can have satan you don't like him anymore come believe in me i forgive you of all sins and we'll take care of all that so verse 20 for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes that is his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived being understood by what has been made that they are without excuse. And I think this is the key verse. The whole chapter is excellent, but this is the key verse for cosmology, that Paul is stating that, that the, the creation itself testifies to us that there is a God and that we have no excuse. And I believe that's true. Even if you don't know there's a rakia over your head, I believe that's true just by looking at the intricacy of the creation itself, all the ecosystems, all the ways things work together. The fact that the default state of the human body is healing, not, not destruction and death, but healing. Um, you know, these things that are built in indicate that we were created for life, not for death. Every, everybody knows that death shouldn't be here. It doesn't feel right. But two, you know, we see things like the fact that everybody has unique um, irises, everybody has unique fingerprints, everybody has unique DNA. There's this uniqueness, this, this consideration of each individual person, that they're not just some kind of cog in a machine, but that they're, they're designed, they're, they're valued, they're loved, they're individuals, um, and that God has gone to great lengths to lift us out of the deception we're in. And so we can look at creation and see its intricacy and its beauty. And we can also, um, uh, you know, see that he has sent his son on the cross. I mean, our whole calendar points to that 
moment in history where, where Yeshua, Jesus, arrived and gave his life on the cross for our sins and, and brings us back into faith through his word. And so to me, cosmology is tremendously important to a person knowing there's a God and that he loves them and that he wants to save them. And that's why Satan works so hard uh, to deceive regarding just that first chapter, first page of the Bible, because he wants to ensure that we keep him as the false father and that we end up destroyed. He's he's a really truly the the epitome of evil. He's a wicked being seeking to destroy us, and yet God loves us. And so that that encourages me um, when I'm talking to people who are opponents of cosmology, just remembering that unbelief is the problem. The person is not my problem. Yes. The unbelief that the serpent has whispered in their ear, that's my problem. That's my enemy, not the person. And if you ever get into flat earth debates with people, which Josh, I know you do, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I, the viewers, if, if they get into them, it can help them to not get so overwhelmed by the fact that somebody might be being mean or frustrated or what have you. Just remember that unbelief is the enemy. The serpent is the enemy and the person is not. And in fact, God is doing good for that person and wanting to bring them back into the kingdom. And it helps us to continue to walk in love despite how they may be acting. So I know that was, uh, that was, that was a long segment, but <laughs> Roman, it's all right. Romans it's, 120 super yeah. important creation points us it. to the fact that God exists. <laughs> also, also uh, we got to understand why does Satan attack this so much? Well, when you read in Genesis, uh, you know, you got to understand that how reliable is Genesis, right? Well, Moses, uh, you know, the Lord speaks to Aaron and Miriam in, in Numbers 12, verses 4 through 8. And what he says is uh, that he, he comes to other prophets, uh, you know, in, in visions and dreams, which 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 validates uh, Ezekiel because he's coming to he's having a vision. But who's right. given him that vision? Well, none other than God himself. Right. So he's not going right. to give him a lie. And then also he says he comes to him in dreams, which, uh, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel 4, 1. Uh, he he gave Nebuchadnezzar that dream, right? So that's coming from yeah. God where he's at the highest tree and he's seeing the ends of the earth. And then also he says what he says about Moses, though, the important part is he speaks to Moses mouth to mouth or face to face yeah. in the New King James. It validates Genesis because he was able to speak to the Most High um, face to face, right? We need to yeah. understand that. And also uh, Jesus says as well that for if in uh, John 4, 546 if you believe moses you would believe me for he wrote about me uh if you do not believe his writings how will you believe my words so he's yep. validating moses right and and it, it has to be a first-hand account from the most high when he when we go over genesis okay it has to be because you know moses was not alive during when adam and eve were alive right so he has he's on mount sinai god's giving him all this information this stuff is not coming from moses's brain he's not just writing it thinking it up it has to be a firsthand account. So it's very important because he knows that Genesis is literally God's word speaking to Moses, yeah. right? And and right. Satan is like, I can't have this, right? And I don't think people think that deeply about the book of Genesis or or anything. I don't think they think that deeply, but this is what it is. It has to be, you know? Oh, Again, yeah. Because you're seeing like firsthand accounts from people like, like Adam, Eve, uh, also like, you know, Abraham, also, uh, you know, Joseph and all these different people. That weren't alive when Moses was alive. So how was he getting this information? God is telling him exactly what happened, building up to, uh, you know, going through the, the the rest of the Torah, right? Or the rest of the yeah, Bible. Well, for all us. the writers co-validate each other. In other words, they always validate each other as this is accurate. What they said is accurate. And they, they build upon each other because there's actually one author. Yeah. Like the, the human beings are simply uh, being vessels for the Holy Spirit to share yeah. the truth with humanity. And, you know, Jesus himself validates the entire Old Testament. I mean, yeah. he he regularly quotes from it. He regularly makes the case that it's true. And so the truth is, within the scriptures, everything is co-validated. Now, from the outside of the scriptures, what you'll find is, as you believe what's written, you start to receive it. And so it, 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 it also self-validates. So the scriptures will become active in your life. In fact, for example, Jesus bore the curse of the law in Deuteronomy 28. Well, when you truly believe he bore the curse of the law and you begin receiving the blessings of the law in scripture, um, you know that there is a God behind the, the writings that are in the Bible. 
because these cannot occur uh, you know, simply by coincidence. They begin to actually activate in your life, starting with the gospel, the message of Jesus, and then continuing on with everything else. And it's interesting because what I've noted is I actually believed what the Bible said about cosmology before I was believing all the flat earth science that I was seeing. And so I obviously I, I affirm the flat earth science, but I started to see the videos on YouTube, but I actually went to the Bible and reading the Bible is what brought me to belief in how cosmology works. And then it was like my eyes were open to, oh, wow, they can pull objects that have supposedly gone over the curve at eight inches you know, per mile squared uh, back into view as long as the atmospheric lensing is reduced due to lower moisture and you've got a strong enough zoom lens. And you know, the, just various truths like that began to then validate what the scriptures say. And so ultimately what you find is the Bible is true even if you don't have external proof. But as you begin to get to know the external proofs as well, it just continues to validate and it continues to show that, wow, this is all truly the word of God. And that is why there's so much resistance to it. Uh, and let me give you an example. Um, folks always curse using the name of Jesus. They never curse using the name of Muhammad or another prophet or another God or what have you. They never use those names as curses, not in anywhere on earth. People do not stub their toe and go, oh, Prophet Muhammad. They just they just don't do that. Yes, sir. Why is that? Well, because the word of God is true and there is a serpent here. So what does he want you to do? Well, he wants you to violate one of the big 10, one of the 10 commandments given to Moses. That's an eye. He wants you to state the name of God, right? One of the names, the, the father, the son of the spirit, state one of the names and use it in an inappropriate manner. And once you've done that, you've sinned, right? And if you've sinned, you're under his authority. And if you're under his authority, he then attacks you. He's known as the tormentor. He's known as the deceiver. He has so many different names. In fact, in Exodus, when the Israelites put the blood on their doorposts, which represents the lamb's blood, Jesus being the lamb of God, sacrificed for us, um, it says, God says, if you put the lamb's blood on your doorpost, I will rebuke the devourer from your homes. In other words, I will not allow the destroyer, says I will rebuke the destroyer. I think that's the term he uses there. Um, I will rebuke the, the destroyer from your homes. In other words, when you start to believe God and obey God, um, then that that destroyer is actually rebuked from your life. As Jesus said in the Gospel of John, he said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they might have life and life more abundant. And that is God's heart towards us. Yes. So ultimately, the Bible validates itself. One within itself, it's always consistent. There are no, there's nothing in scripture that actually contradicts scripture. And I can tell you that as someone who's been studying it now over 20 years, nothing contradicts itself in this book. Um, what you'll find is apparent contradictions on the surface that when you look into them a little bit more deeply, um, you'll find they don't contradict and it is consistent and it's just the serpent at work like usual. Yeah. Um, it's oftentimes it's translation errors. That's what it comes down to most of the time. But secondly, that our creation, our cosmology will prove that this is true. And as you start to see that NASA's lying and these other groups are lying, why are they lying is the big question that gets asked. And the reason they're lying whether they know it themselves or not, is because there's a serpent here who wants to destroy us and separate us from our creator. And one of the best ways, one of the first things he does is hide creation from us. That's one of his primary tactics. So this book is true. Literally everything else is a lie. Even your eyes. The scriptures say we walk by faith, not by sight. You can't even trust your eyes. Eve's, Eve's problem was her eyes. This is what we've got to recognize. God's word's true regardless of my eyes. She saw, pay attention in Genesis 3, it says she saw the fruit and that it was pleasing to the eyes. And then after they both ate, it says the eyes of them both were open. Three times the scriptures refer to mankind switching to his eyes instead of believing what God has said from the heart. And that's why returning to God is all about believing with the heart rather than seeing with the eyes. Jesus talks about cutting your eye out too, right? <laughs> like, it, yeah, yeah. It's like, what, what, you know, because it, 
That's yeah, just, it'd be better to lose your eye than, yeah, than yeah, to yeah. end up in hell. Yeah, just so that you could have your eye. Yeah. The only verse that I that I that I found uh that that agrees with uh the cosmology is not in our Bible, ladies and gentlemen. The only verse that agrees is actually in the false prophet Joseph Smith's Book of Mormon. Okay, guys, that's yeah. the only one that agrees. So listen to this, guys, because th- th- you could tell the enemy at work. Helaman 12, it's called Helaman. That's pretty interesting. Helaman 1215 <laughs> uh, reads, according to his word, the earth goeth back and it appeareth uh, unto man that the sun standeth still. Yeah, behold, this is so, for surely it is the earth that moveth and not the sun. So this is completely opposite of what our Bible says. So we need yeah. to understand that that's the only one I found. And uh, so we can kind of get into some verses now uh, on, on biblical cosmology. I I could start out kind of, you know, get into Genesis. I I, I know we're already, we're already like 40 minutes in and we've already crushed. We're just kind of showing you guys the, the foundation, the basis of what we need to understand as we go into move into this, uh, you know, biblical cosmology. So, well, talking um, about Joseph Smith brings up something about NASA. So Joseph Smith was a verified Mason. In fact, all of the 33 founders, degree too. I, I hear right, so. right. All of the founders of Mormonism were, yeah, were, were Freemasons, um, yeah. high ranking Freemasons. Yes. And they are very manipulative individuals and the book of Mormon. And then of course, doctrines and covenants and the other writings of Mormonism are not uh, scripture. Um, yeah, they, there, there are no scrolls. There, there's nothing. A, a, an angel Moroni appeared to Joseph Smith supposedly and gave him some tablets. He wrote down the tablets. He's the sole translator of the tablets. Then the tablets disappeared again and there is no record. We just have Joseph Smith's word to take for it. And that's that's not how things worked in scripture, number one. Number two, um, all of the true prophets always validate each other and his writings deviate more than once from the scriptures as though he has some kind of special revelation. So he has all the signs of being uh, a con artist and specifically a Mason, which brings up really important truth as well is, all right. So people always ask, you know, all right, if it's all one big lie, and I'm sure you've heard this a lot, Josh, if it's all one big lie, um, then, you know, why you're telling me that every NASA employee is in on it. You know, that's a pretty typical question. No, no none of us claim that every NASA employee is in on it any more than every little kid in elementary school is in on it. You know, we, we've been <laughs> deceived. That's the whole point. People are <laughs> deceived. However, there are people that are serving Satan here on earth as much as you and I are serving Jesus. Uh, uh, these people are charlatans and deceivers, just like their father, Satan. And they are openly serving him because they, they do believe that they can ascend and be like God. They do believe that they can ultimately win this battle of good and evil and that um, everything will be better if we didn't have God and his commandments ruling over us. And so, in fact, that's even the term. God literally means ruler. So Elohim in Hebrew is the ruler. So like the point is Satan wants to be the ruler instead of uh, our father in heaven. And so the Masons uh, are known for being a very secretive fraternal organization. In fact, this is true about any fraternal organization. Uh, they're very secretive. They have lots of rituals. Mormonism adopted a lot of those rituals. And it's usually the Masons at the highest levels of government, including NASA, that are operating on behalf of the serpent directly and then deceiving everybody else. So you you don't need everyone to be a Satanist. You don't need everyone uh, to be a Mason, um, you know, in order to deceive and to have authority and power. You just need some of the top dogs. You just need some of the top people in top positions of authority. And those people can do a lot of damage because they're in a a strong uh, position, but they are actively serving Satan. So yes, there are people that are actively serving Satan, though that is not the majority. However, everyone who is not believing the father of heavenly lights and in his son, Jesus, uh, is by default serving Satan because they're serving the lie. Yeah. Um, they're, they're not believing the truth. And so some people are directly serving Satan. Some people are indirectly serving Satan. The people who are indirectly are essentially deceived. And so we are trying to save them. The other group, um, in Freemasonry, when you go high enough, what you learn, uh, as you study, uh, Pike and some of the, some of the writings of some of the Freemasons, 
uh, you will end up blaspheming the Holy Spirit, which is the only unforgivable sin in Scripture. They do that on purpose. They have you take a vow once you're at a high enough level of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, where you say all sorts of wicked pre-written things. Um, and at that point, you're sealed. It's the same as taking the mark of the beast in Revelation. You're sealed. You're you're on the devil's team. You've decided. You're like a fallen angel. The fallen angels don't have any redemption opportunity. They're sealed in the opposite end. So there are people here on earth that are incapable of repentance and are serving Satan, just like Satan is incapable of repentance. That is not the majority. The majority are open for salvation, and the Lord is reaching out to them. So I thought you brought up a good point, Josh, just bringing up. You know, of course, a Mormon who is a Mason is going to promote false cosmology because that's who all these astronauts are. I mean, all these guys who go to space, you know, uh, they're always Freemasons, you know, <laughs> so they're all, always part of a fraternal organization. And Jesus said, I have said nothing in secret. Yes. That that That's Jesus's attitude. He's the light. He's above ground. He's not talking in secret. We're just simply supposed to believe what he says, but they literally meet in secret and talk in secret. And then they go out and they lie to everybody. And they, they, it really, it is terrible that we are in, I mean, I see why Paul says, you know, to live as Christ, to die as gain, you know, this, yeah. this war zone down here and you're, you know, you're a veteran. Thank you for your service. Uh, uh, this is a war zone. This is a spiritual war zone. It's every single day that we wake up, that we're in this war. Some people are trying to pretend they're not in it. But we are in this war and we want to save as many people as we can with the true words of the gospel. And if cosmology helps them come to Christ, then I'm all for it. You know, that's why I've started so, talking so about it. cosmology with people, because I want to help people understand that you're being lied to from day one. I mean, you go you walk into kindergarten and there's a globe in there and it's like <laughs> day one you're being lied to. And so we're you know, we got a lot of layers of lies to undo here, Josh. It's, it's yes. quite a few. So I'm glad more Christians are waking up to, you know, the importance of cosmology, that this, if the devil's spending billions of dollars a year, or, tr you know, trillions of dollars uh, through NASA and these other space agencies, then uh, we should probably take it equally serious. You know, he seems to take it really serious. For sure. So, and then uh, before, and also uh, Copernicus, there's a, there's a uh, Freemason lodge named after him, Galileo. And Sir yep. Isaac Newton, and I'm sure you could keep going down the list of these people that push this lie and find a lodge named after him. So you see them all with the uh, the compass on each one of their pictures all the time. They have the compass. They're 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 showing hom they're paying homage to Freemasonry. And you brought up a good point that they they blast me the Holy Spirit so that that's like part yep. of like selling your soul so that that's right. the way you sell your soul because that's that's the one that's the unpardonable sin so that's right. that's a really good point i've never ever uh, looked at it that way and that's very important so well and low level masons do not do that so it's, of course, it's at a higher level that they truly become satanists lower level masons are as deceived typically as the average man you know yeah. it's, it's as you get you get higher in the ranks yes um and then uh so we could go into uh you know genesis 1 um, how, you know, Genesis one, uh, one, two, do you, do you believe like in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth? The, the way that I interpret that part is in the beginning, Elohim created Shemaim and the land. Um, I would think that God laid the foundations of the earth there and created the, the two heavens, which would be where the moon, sun, and the stars are located and where his throne is located. Cause he hasn't created the second heaven, which I believe would be the firmament. So I think that when he says that in the beginning, God created the heavens, which would be where the moon, sun, and the stars are located and where God's throne is located. And it says the land, I think maybe he laid the foundations there. I don't know. Some people say that's just a title. So I, I don't know, man. I think that God, because it says in uh, Isaiah 40, 22, that he laid the foundations at the beginning. He said that the angels were clapping and cheering when he laid the foundations of the earth. I think he would be laying this and not this continents yet. That's what I personally believe. But what, what do you think about that? Because it says the earth was without form and void, which is the land. So the land is without form and void. It's just in water, but the foundations could be there. He could have created Sheol and then the great deep, maybe. Um, because it says the sure. uh, darkness I, I think, on the face of the deep, the abuso. Yeah, right? I I think that um, you know, there's merit to the idea that that first sentence is simply stating, here's what you're about to read, right? Yeah, you know, the, yeah. in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then the natural question is, well, how? And then the the proceeding verses are how. You know, this is this yeah. is what he did. Um, it, it makes sense that he did create foundations, um, whether you know, uh 
that's what verse one is talking about or not, it's very clear that he did do that. Um, <clears throat> and so I think at the end of the day, what stands out to me about Genesis one, what, what really, there's several things in Genesis one, but, but what really starts to stand out to me is one that, that light is made in verse three and that preexists the sun. Um, so light is something that, that is not uh, sun dependent, if that yeah. makes sense. Um, and, and then, uh, as you continue on, verse six is really where things start to get interested. So of most course. Bibles are going to say, so you've got a King James, so it's going to say it correctly. Uh, I have an NASB 95. It's going to call it an expanse. It says, then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters uh, above from the waters below or the waters from the waters. Problem is expanse. Um, and I, if folks don't know about this, this is a wonderful app. There's an app called um, Literal Word. I preach out of this app pretty frequently. Literal Word has the concordance built in, which is really nice when you're on the go. Uh, you can get it for free on your iPhone or on your Andro uh, Android. And uh, it's got the NSB, but it also has the King James. So I'm going to switch the King James and it'll say it correctly. So verse six, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And the reason why the folks in King James translated it firmament uh, is because the Hebrew word is rakia, R-A-Q-I-A. That's the transliteration. Um, and it means a solid, a solid vault. That's what it means. A solid vault over the earth. That's, that's, that's what that word means. That's what it means everywhere. In fact, I'd love to read Ezekiel 1 in a moment because it, it's used there to describe exactly, you know, how this works, that it's over our heads. Um, and, and then verse 7, and God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so, and God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Now, there are multiple heavens in the scriptures. Um, and the point is the third heaven is the heaven of God, where he, his throne is that's even above the firmament that's above the waters above, Just, uh, yeah. but our atmosphere is also called the heavens. And so you don't want to get confused. Um, and this is the problem with translations is we, we don't speak Hebrew, but if we're reading in Hebrew, it would say Rakia sometimes, and then it would use other words for, you know, the atmosphere or what have you. So it's important to recognize that Rakia is this solid dome that's over our heads. That's, that's the first topic that's introduced in the Bible that should call into question what we've been told. Because we're being told, and I mentioned this in one of my little viral videos, but we're being told that there's a vacuum of space. We understand that the lack of atmosphere creates a pulling effect, so we call it a vacuum. Uh, because it wants to stabilize, it wants to balance out the atmosphere between the two, um, and that there is this vacuum of space uh, touching our atmosphere, gradually touching our atmosphere. I don't care how gradual it is. There's no such thing as a gradual touching of the atmosphere, um, and, and yet it's not pulling our atmosphere out and making us all suffocate instantly. In fact, life would have never began uh, if, if that's how this worked, and yet we see with actual scientific experiments that to have a vacuum an atmosphere next to each other, you have to have a solid barrier between the two. Mm -hmm. And yet, what are we told by earthly uh, cosmological arguments? Well, we're told that the vacuum of space touches the atmosphere of Earth because of something called gravity. And what you'll find is that gravity is God in worldly cosmology. Gravity is God. Without gravity, none of what they say works. And yet they can't reproduce gravity. The closest I've seen is a professor taking a piece of material and stretching it out in a circle and rolling some balls on it and then talking about how they're being pulled to the center. And that's gravity. Well, number one, that, that experiment is terrible because it's all it's proving is that the weight of the balls are being drawn to the center weakest point of the fabric. And so they're going to where the, the, the center of mass is. That's, that's why they're there. So that's terrible. We can't reproduce gravity. And what we witness with our eyes is never gravity. If you study uh, uh, density, buoyancy, and mass, what you'll find is these phenomena that we've named all account for what we call gravity. You don't even need gravity as an equation. In fact, it brings up a really important point about NASA. NASA has a bunch, a ton of engineering documents on NASA.gov. This isn't even conspiratorial. This is, this is, you can go look for these things and see them. 
And within all these engineering documents, it says, assume a flat, non-rotating Earth. Do not add curvature, do not add gravity, do not add any sort of mathematical equations beyond assuming a flat, non-rotating Earth with air as your atmosphere, and you're just dealing with lift and density and velocity and very normal scientific phenomena, um, you know, physics, true physics is what you're dealing with. And, and as a result of this, uh, you, you cannot design an aircraft using these extra equations. They would make your aircraft crash. It would not work. And so everyone knows even mathematically, that gravity is a joke. It's, it's never useful for anything. It's only useful for the lie. And what you find in scripture is that no, the, the, the gravity doesn't exist. God exists. And he's created us inside of this terrarium. And there is no vacuum of space above. It's not touching our atmosphere. It's not possible. Science is supposed to be observable, testable, repeatable. There is no scientific experiment that shows this can even be done. That's because it can't be done. And instead, there is a bunch of water above us and over the firmament. We're essentially inside of a terrarium, underwater, submerged, and then heaven is immediately above those waters. That's how the scriptures indicate things work, as, as Josh was showing us on the screen with this yep. uh, ancient Hebrew conception of the universe. Yeah, this is if you take the Bible literal word for word and don't construe anything in the Bible, this is pretty much what comes out. Okay, so we have uh, Psalms 19.1. I think this is important because the devil hates this firmament. He hates the firmament. He doesn't want to make right. it solid. He wants to make it an expanse. Psalms 19.1 right. says, The heavens declare the glory of God. So that's the heavens, which is going to be heavens is going to be the first one would be like atmosphere where the moon, sun and the stars are located. The second heaven, which is, is, is in Genesis 1, 8, is the firmament. God called the firmament heaven. The third heaven where God's throne is located. So he says the heavens, which is where the moon, sun and the stars are located. And then heavens is also where God's throne is located is it declare the glory of God. But the firmament showeth his handiwork. If you look Amen. at that word handiwork. It actually means God's achievement. So if you yeah. deny that there's a firmament, you are Im immediately denying God's achievement. And it's raka, which is to spread. That's what the root word is for rakia. So that is him beating out and creating this. If you were God, wouldn't you want a barrier where a, a human being couldn't physically make it to heaven? I mean, we, right. we talked about the Tower of Babel, right? So that's that's what he he, he did. And on the sec and on the second day, he never said. Uh, it is good. He said it is good on day one, day three, day four, day five, day six. Not saying the firmament is not good, but it actually separated him from uh, from man. You know what I mean? We've got to understand that. So you got to have that. So and then we have also uh, he was speaking of Ezekiel one twenty two, um, uh, and Ezekiel one twenty three, Ezekiel one twenty six. This is all referring to the firmament. Ezekiel one twenty six has a and above the firmament, which is the firmament is going to be here. This is a vision from God. It says that I come to my prophets in vision, vision from God. And above the firmament, or if you want to use the uh, the CJB, it would say above the dome. Dome yeah. would be the, this here uh, was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of appearance of a man upon above upon it. Right. It also is talking in Ezekiel 123 about cherubim being beneath the firmament. Now, I think that's interesting, right? I think it's interesting because if you look at the book of Daniel, and Daniel's here on earth, he's he's fasting for 21 days, a 21-day fast, and he's praying to, to God, and an angel goes to deliver the message to God. Coming back, he actually gets in a, a physical fight with, uh, with uh, the, the prince of Persia. It takes 21 days. So where is yep. that fight happening? Where the moon, sun, and the stars are located is where this fight is happening. It's taking 21 days. He has to actually call on Michael the Archangel to help him. Finally, he comes back to Daniel. Probably like if, if you did breathe, you'd be out of breath like you're in a fight. It's a, okay, finally, I'm here. Daniel's like, where have you been? What's going on? You know, he explains he's fighting. So I do believe there's a lot more going on right here where the moon, sun, and the stars are located spiritually. Then we are to believe, you know, so I think that's interesting. Um, yeah, I, I think two things to point out is Ezekiel 122 um, uh -huh. indicates what the firmament is. It says now over the heads of the living beings. So over our heads, 
uh, there was something like a firmament or, you know, of course, an ASB or if you've got a more modern translation, it's going to say expanse or something. It's going to hide the word firmament like the awesome gleam of crystal spread out over their heads. So yes. we get this idea of this crystallized solid object in verse 22. And then Job chapter 37, verse 18 says, hast thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong and as a molten looking glass, also referring to the firmament. So we have Ezekiel 122 and Job uh, 37, 18, both indicating that whatever the firmament is, it is firm, right? It is actually strong, whether it's, it's, it's like a molten glass, uh, it's like a crystal, I do like seeing that some of the Christians are starting to try and scientifically determine what the firmament is. And I'm sure you've seen this, but the, uh, the frozen oxygen creates this solid uh, blue, beautiful, like crystal like solid ice. Uh, that's pretty amazing. That actually makes a lot of sense to me uh, as being potentially what the material of the firmament is, although it could be something else. Uh, because where does the firmament touch down? Well, it touches down on the Antarctic circle that circles the entire Earth. And so if it requires being cold, then that's why it would touch the coldest part of the Earth. And then, of course, the waters above, I imagine, are also very cold, too. Any Anytime you have water uh, at a very deep depth and there's no light or warmth hitting it, it's going to be extremely cold. It may not freeze because it's got saline in it, but it's it's extremely cold. So it's, it's interesting to think about. I've seen some other theories as well of what the firmament is. But even NASA's scientific uh, model indicates that as you go higher in the atmosphere, the temperature drops uh, significantly. And I agree with that. I, I think, I mean, even on an aircraft, the, the temperature drops quite a bit when you're just flying on, a, on an airliner at 30,000 feet. So as you get into the hundreds of thousands of feet, um, uh, and we don't know exactly how high the firmament is, we know it's lower towards the Arctic Circle and it's higher towards the center of the Earth. Um, you know, you're going to get colder and colder air, which would also indicate how the firmament would remain frozen. Um, I, I, one of my beliefs is the reason why there is a military base for every single nation on Antarctica is, for one, their bases are closest to their country on the circle. And two, I believe they're doing experiments trying to figure out what this firmament thing is, uh, just like they were in the Tower of Babel. I mean, they wanted to break through, which brings up another point. Tower of Babel is really just a joke of a story if they were going to build that tower into the atmosphere and suffocate and die. What we know about Earth being closer to Eden uh, was vegetation was larger, oxygen was higher, there's going to be uh, greater support. This is a greenhouse. There's going to be a greater support for life. So oxygen going higher would not have been an issue depending on where they were on the Earth. And two, um, if it were a vacuum of space, they would. there's no reason for God to intervene in that story in Genesis. It, it, they, they would have just suffocated and died uh, in the stratosphere. They would have suffocated and died. God doesn't have to intervene. It, it really is a silly story. And that's the devil's whole point, is if the devil can make the story seem silly instead of literal, then you discredit the whole Bible. Now, when you believe there's a ferment over your head, and that vegetation was larger, similar to like the redwoods in California or what have you. Vegetation was larger, more oxygen on Earth, um, higher temperatures overall. Then when you climb into the atmosphere with a tower and you intend to break through, God's intervention now makes sense because there is an actual firmament. They are building it to break through. And God said nothing that they set their uh, minds to do would be impossible for them. So they, what they intended to do as far as starting to break through the firmament, not overthrow God, but starting to break through the firmament, he said would be possible for them at some point, even if it was going to take another thousand years to figure it out, it doesn't really matter. So he intervened and slowed down that process. Now, what you'll find is in Operation Dominic, and specifically inside of Operation Dominic was Operation Fishbowl, our lovely government was shooting nuclear weapons into the stratosphere. And I believe that that was, was it's that same Tower of Babel spirit testing out the firmament, seeing how it works, seeing if we can break through. And so they were literally detonating nuclear weapons onto the firmament, which is, it's just so bizarre in the first place. Like, oh yeah. And this is what they always say. Oh, we just wanted to see what nukes do way up in the sky. <laughs> okay. Like, <laughs> it's just absurd. You know, what are we shooting nukes in the sky for? <laughs> Why would we want to risk potentially having you know, some kind of cataclysmic negative effect from the nuclear fallout coming back onto the earth. It just, it seems very stupid. And yet 
for the Satanists, they're like, no, we've been trying to break through this firmament, you know, for the last few thousand years. And now it starts to make sense that nothing new under the sun, just like Ecclesiastes said, these evil guys are still trying to overthrow God. Yes. And uh, that's a very interesting point. And, and uh, Dominique means belonging to the Lord. And and the, the bigger one, like the, the main mission was Dominique Chama. Dominique was Operation Dominique is what you hear on. But if you study a little deeper, it's Dominique Chama. Uh, Chama means shell and and belonging to the Lord. So we got a fixed shell belonging the to the shell Lord. Belonging that they're to trying. The they're we trying to break to, through the shell. They're wow. trying to break through the shell with Thor's missiles or all these different Greek gods. Yep. And they're trying to. Yep. Use, that's just basically middle finger to to the Lord, right? So, oh yeah, and that's the thing too. Is the starry host is always named after pagan gods. Yes. Because that's what this is. This is all paganism. This is not science. This is paganism that is presenting itself like some kind of academic intellectual practice. And really, it's all a bunch of pseudoscience. And there's not even proof of gravity or vacuums touching atmospheres without solid barriers. There's just they say it so assertively, but they're lying. They're lying. I, when I hear NASA uh astronauts speak and they just sound like they're telling the truth i guarantee you that's what the serpent sounds like he just he just sounds like he's telling the truth he's not telling the truth but you can't tell you can't perceive it you have to just know that god's word is true you can't listen to what this guy is saying or what he's showing you he's lying to you all right so we have amos 9 6 this is an nasb 2020 version the reason why is because i like what they what the way that they interpret this word and uh, I'm going to go to the Strong's recorded so you guys know. So Amos 9, 6, the one who builds his upper chambers in the heavens, which is up here above the firmament, yep. he who caused the waters. Oh, no, sorry. The one who builds his upper chambers in the heavens and founded his vaulted dome, which is going to be this over the earth. Um, what does that word vaulted dome mean? Um, it's it's a Gouda, right? So vaulted dome, it's if you're going to see it in the King James as being troops. But it's like binding together. And what is it binding? It says the vault of heaven, firmament, binding earth to the heavens. Do you see how it's binding earth? You see how it connects yep. to the heavens? Okay, binding earth to the heavens. That verse is basically talking about the firmament. And it's talking about how God walks in the upper chambers. We got to understand that. And it says vault of heavens, firmament, binding earth to the heavens. That's That's basically telling you that the firmament connects to the earth. And it's binding heaven to the earth. If you look at Revelation, if you look at Revelation, God makes a new heaven and a new earth. If it was not connected, he would never have to make a new heaven and a new earth. Also in Joel 2.10, it talks about the he it talks about the earth shaking and the heavens shaking. Well, they're connected. Um, uh, also, you see uh, in, uh, I think it's, I don't want to quote it if it's not off the top of my head. I wouldn't like to say it. But anyways, so guys, understand that it's the firmament is binding heaven to the earth and above it is God's throne. I think it's interesting. So why would he need to build a new heaven, new earth if, if, if earth was here orbiting the sun and all this stuff is going on and then God's throne is trillions upon trillions of miles away, right? He wouldn't have to build a new heaven and new earth. So why would we have that? And then what happens? The firmament is taken out. God comes down to earth. And you see that it's like, uh, it's a, what is, I don't remember how the cubits, what, 1500 by 1500, something like that. I can't remember. And it, it's like a cube, yeah. right? They see that the new yeah. heaven, new earth. Yeah. So it yeah. comes down and it lands on the earth. It's not coming down on a spear. It's a new heaven, new earth. No more firmament right. anymore. So, and God's walking amongst us. So I think that's interesting, but that's something I think people need to understand. Um, Amos 9, 6, also that kind of matches with what we were talking about with Ezekiel being right there, seeing God's throne above it, yeah. above the firmament. And then also Isaiah 40, 22, we well, need to understand this. It is he, the Lord God that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. How is he sitting upon the circle of the earth? This is a circle. There's a firmament. God's throne is above that. So he's actually literally sitting on the circle of the earth, looking down on us like grasshoppers. It says he spreads out the, the heavens like a curtain, right? And, and, and like a tent to dwell in, right? Like a tent. The tents back then were dome-shaped, right? They're dope-shaped. They're like tabernacles, which you could call it in, in uh, Psalms 19, two, uh, verse 2 through 6. So we have a firmament. And God's throne, how is he sitting upon the circle of the earth? He's sitting, looking down on us. 
like grasshoppers. We got to understand that it, it's it's beautiful when you when you understand the verses. Yeah, like that. And Psalm nineteen indicates that the sun circuits the earth inside of the tent. Yes. So the tent is the firmament. The sun is small and closer. Now people think it's large and ninety three million miles away, but there's something called crepuscular rays that would not exist if the sun were that far away, that large. All the rays that come through the clouds would come through at the same angle, just be based on the size of the light and, and where it was located. However, because the light is much closer to the earth, much smaller, we get crepuscular rays, which are the angled rays that come through the clouds. And that's because literally the sun is small and close. That's a phenomena. So all these, there's so much phenomena that we witness with our eyes, uh, but because we're not believing the word of God, we literally can't see it, even though it's right in front of our eyes. I mean, I live in the Daytona Beach area. I can go to the beach essentially any time, and I can tell you that that horizon is horizontal. I mean, it is flat. Earth, yeah. <laughs> Earth is flat. The water that you're looking at is flat. There is no curvature occurring, um, you know, unless you're using a fisheye lens and looking at the recording on a screen, your eyes will just not ever see curvature. It doesn't doesn't exist. You have to be lied to. Um, now, you brought up the circle of the earth in Isaiah 40, 22. I think this is really important, is it says uh, that he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. Okay, that's Isaiah 40, chapter 40, verse 22. Now, there is a Hebrew word for sphere that's used in Isaiah chapter 22, verse 18. That word is dir, do you are. Um, and yet Isaiah 40, 22 says circle, which is H-U-G, hug. Uh, and that that's the difference between those two words. So Isaiah did have a word at his disposal to say ball or sphere. And he did not use that word when speaking to the earth. He said circle. He said that the, the, the father is sitting above the circle of the earth. The scriptures talk about this regularly, that the earth is the Lord's footstool, that he's literally sitting above it and that his feet rest upon it. It's his footstool. And, and yeah. that gives you an idea of how big uh, I imagine the father is, you know. Yeah, <laughs> so we, we, and Isaiah... We, we, Isaiah yeah, 66, 1, he says the earth is his footstool. He's sitting upon the circle of the earth. If it, if it was the right. other model, the other cosmology, he'd be sitting upon the circle of the galaxies or the universe or the cosmos, but he's actually sitting right. upon the circle of the earth. And also, if you went back to the Greek, there's a word also they could have used in the Septuagint, a spiro, right? Or spira. They could have used that instead, but they ended up, 72, uh, you know, the story about the Septuagint, you know, 72 uh, Hebrew scholars from six from each tribe are all there. Are, 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 uh, is that it? Six from each tribe? Something of the sort. Okay. Anyways, so they're in there. They're, they're writing. They all have to make sure they, they, they translate it correctly. They could have used, you know, Spiro. They use circle in, in, um, in, uh, in Greek as well. So, but let's read uh, Psalms 19.1. We kind of went over that. Uh, we need to understand that, you know, the firmament, we kind of, we, we, we kind of crushed on that. Uh, let's talk about the sun moving, right? We have uh, the heavens declare the glory of God. This is Psalms 19, 1, verses 1 through 6. Now, also, Psalms 19, 1 is on uh, Werner von Braun's tombstone. I believe it's like a breadcrumb because if you continue reading verses 2 through 6, it's it's conflating, definitely conflicting with, the, with our current cosmology, 100%. So it says, uh, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto yep. day, utter with speech, night unto night, show with knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. And them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. You guys can go into Strong's Concordance and click tabernacle. That word tabernacle, as uh, Rich has, has gone through before in his sermons, tabernacle means tent. So there's a tent for the sun. If you read that without knowing that, you're going to not really understand it too well. You're going to say tabernacle. What is that? When you click the Strong's Concordance, it's going to tell you that it's a tent. And the tents back then were dome shaped. Okay. So now the sun is, is, has a tent, right? To move in. It says, exactly. which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man running a race. When you run a race, you start at one point and you end at the same point right that's that's kind of it's it's like analogy talking right here uh which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices a strong man running a race his going forth going forth right uh his his going forth is from the end of heaven to this and his circuit unto the ends of it and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof so it's talking about the ends of heaven 
heaven is the firmament is is a heaven and also like you said atmosphere where the moon sun and the stars are located is a heaven so it goes to the ends of heaven right and it's a circuit which is like compass or you could say circle making a circle right so it's talking about it moving over the earth um i think that's interesting and also i think uh there's something else that i, I wanted to mention there but to go back to another verse. oh going forth if you go to the book uh, of ecclesiastes Verses one through five, I'll go there really quick so you guys understand what circuit means or going forth. I think that's the important word, going forth, because people think that the sun rises, the sun sets in the Bible, and they're like, well, if it literally rose and it literally literally set, then, you know, but we need to understand, even in the, in the book of Ecclesiastes, when it says that the sun uh, ariseth, it's, it's actually talking about it coming forth or going forth, just like uh, uh, Psalms 19.1 talks about. Which means that it's going away from you or coming towards you in, in Ecclesiastes verses one through five. I think that's interesting, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, you bring up an important point, I think, uh, regarding, um, you know, what people are doing. They're, they're worshiping the sun. They're worshiping the starry host. Deuteronomy chapter four, verse 19 talks about this. This is not a new um, practice. It says that when you look up into the sky and see the sun, moon, and stars, all the forces of heaven, don't be seduced into worshiping them. And what you'll find is the way NASA talks and all these, you know, uh, pseudoscientists talk, the way they talk about the stars and the, the heavenly bodies, they, they're just in this state of adoration. They're just, oh, it's just, we're worshiping. We're all made of stardust, you know. And what you start to learn in scripture is that Job talks about the, um, the stars in the firmament being angels and that they're singing. And the scriptures talk about the angels singing quite a bit. And scientifically, you can actually produce light in water. So if there's water just above the firmament, you can produce light in water through a scientific experiment called sonoluminescence, right? Sound, light, light, and, and, and sound. Okay. And under the right conditions, you can produce uh, the layman's term would be a star in a jar. In other words, we can, this is something we can produce, something that the Bible talks about. We can produce sonoluminescence, which would be the right sound wave inside of water creates light. Well, what we're seeing about the stars is they're definitely light. And what we're understanding above the firmament is that there's water. And what the scriptures indicate to us is that there are angels that sing. And so it's very possible that these are angels singing. And I think that Ezekiel 1 points at um, how angels are like wheels inside of wheels, which is mm -hmm. interesting because um, if you think about how light emanates in water, it actually produces a circle and then a circle inside of it. And there I'm are people who have been using their Nikon cameras to zoom in on the stars and give us photos of the stars um, indicate it, it shows us kind of this wheel or this circle inside of a circle, which is exactly what the scriptures are talking about. Yeah, these these wheels in the sky. Um, I love that you were able to pull that up because that's exactly what I'm referring to. <laughs> yeah. they, 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 there's been more and more footage of this phenomenon. And yet we have Ezekiel 1, well before any Zoom cameras, telling us, oh, yeah, there's angels. They're like wheels <laughs> up in the sky. And it's like, there we go. And then we have sonoluminescence, which is uh, uh, light being emitted inside of water uh, as a result of the proper sound waves. So when the scriptures say not to worship these heavenly bodies, uh, there are also fallen angels that exist. Of course, there are what we understand, the demonic unseen spirits. But then there are also spirits in the firmament uh, known as angels. And there are fallen angels. In fact, now this one really interested me when I found it. So um, on Bible Hub, um, maybe we can pull it up. But on Bible Hub, um, there are two Greek words that indicate where the term planet comes from, okay? The first one is planeo. It's uh, Strong's 4105, 4105. And uh, what it means is planeo, it means to cause, to wander, to lead astray, to deceive. Planeo is one of the roots of the English term planet. And wow. so this, yeah, this this is wild. So you can pull that up like on Bible Hub 
or one of the other websites that has yeah, songs built I'll, in. I'll pull it up. I just don't want to get too lost in the <laughs> too lost yeah. in the, all the stuff I have pulled up. So uh, if you guys yeah. want, just check out the strong two coordinates on that. But keep going. I don't want to mess up your thought. Yeah, four four one zero five, and then the other word is planetes, um, and that's four one zero seven. These are real close to each other, and it means a wanderer, properly a wandering star, and figuratively a false teacher operating without moral compass and exploiting other aimless people. Now, what's amazing about this is we've adopted these terms in English. We are exploiting aimless people, meaning people who don't know better. Um, these false teachers are exploiting people and they're teaching them about planets and planets really are just wandering stars and a wandering star would be an angel that has rebelled from the perfect harmony that God has created and you'll notice this about the planets they do not align with the rest of the stars they do their own thing they go on their own circuit okay whereas when you do star trail photography what you find is this perfect circular star trail around the north star polaris which is at the top center of the firmament all circling perfectly and beautifully and then you have these deviations that we call planets and that's because they've left the harmonious uh structure that god has created and they're in rebellion and lo and behold what do people worship they're not worshiping the stars that make those perfect circles okay what do we name all the planets greek gods what are we worshiping the planets what are we talking about i want to go to the planets i want to touch the planets i want to be with the planets and so it's literally just modern paganism people think that they're being scientific and they've been duped into no different than any ancient civilization who built towers and worshiped the stars i mean it's exactly the the egyptian pyramids also line up with the planets the planetes uh once a year i think it is and yeah. and you know that's because they were worshiping those planetes or those planeos these these wandering stars which are really just fallen angels so it's very applicable when deuteronomy says don't be seduced into worshiping the stars why because they represent or even potentially are demons themselves they're fallen angels so do not worship them and what are we doing yeah. Just like with taking the Lord's name in vain, we're worshiping exactly the stars that are outside of alignment with the others, and we name them after Greek gods. Wow. So it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's crazy. And the yeah. book of Jude is saying that the wandering stars will be judged. It's reserved for the blackness and darkness. There forever. it is. So we got to yep. understand that Jude says that. Now, um, also, there's no anywhere in Scripture does it say that Earth is a wandering star, right? He's talking about yeah. wandering stars separating from the Earth, right? So if you take the cosmology of today, it would place Earth as a wandering star, just like these other planets or deceivers or, you know, to to, to make you wander. So people need to yeah. understand that. I see nowhere in Scripture where God is, is, is placing the Earth the same as these wandering stars. No, it's it's our visual look up in the sky you see that the that the planets are doing a different uh you know movement than than the stars so we got to understand yep. that and uh yeah that's something we need to definitely understand i think that's a great point and, that word um, wandering there in jude 1 13 that is yeah. planetes so that word the the greek root word there that gets translated wandering is planetes and then stars is aster similar to astro we we already know that word but planetes so all these words were already being used you know, 2000 years ago in Greek to indicate pagan deities and all of that. So that we're truly, we've literally just inherited what was already here. Yet we think, oh yeah, this is all new. Elon Musk and, and all this star exploration stuff, this is all new. And it's like, no, this is humanity's problem since the fall. <laughs> yes. And, and we can also kind of, uh, you know, we can move into another thing that so we talked about the stars. Uh, that's which is created on day four. We need to understand that the moon, sun, and the stars, and that includes the wandering stars, right? Because they're just stars; they're not planets, like everyone says. I believe that's what I believe. But um, also in uh, like the flood, for example, if you guys look up the flood, there's three events that happen. Okay, this is very, very, very important. I I was talking to this gentleman in a debate yesterday. He was trying to tell me it's a local flood. I had to kind of go over everything because. When you start digging into science too much and, and you're basically going to take everything that scripture says and con contort it, you know, contort it like the, like kind of like how Satan does. But anyway, yep. so we have we have the, the first thing that happens is the fountains of the great deep were broken. So water's coming from below. Um, it says that that the windows of heaven, which would be the windows of the firmament, were open. 
And then it said yep. that it, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, so there's three separate events that happen. Uh, if there's a firmament connected to what we believe would be like Antarctica, then all you have to do is fill this fishbowl. It says 15 cubits above the highest mountain. So the water would fill up yep. above the highest mountain. The whole entire earth would be flooded, including everything on the earth, which God says. Um, the reason, you know, you got to understand when when God talks about the heaven, you know, like the promise the promise is I will never flood the entire earth again, you know, and it also says I'll kill all creatures walking. He's talking about all creatures. So the flood is definitely worldwide. And on the on this uh, model, the biblical model, it's no problem with it happening. And it also yep. says, you know, in the flood, like basically he closed the waters of the great deep. He says that he stopped the windows of heaven. But if you look up that word, it means closed. So he closed the windows of heaven. And then he also made it stop raining for, you know, the 40 days and 40 nights. So that stopped. So there's three well, separate events. Just verse 11 really points out several things that we need to either believe or not believe. And this, this tells you a lot about your heart, where you are with God right now. So Genesis 7, 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, all right. Do you believe that's true? Right. Like that. That's the first question to ask. You've never seen. And this is people rely on their eyes. I've never seen anyone live to 600 years. Right? I, I've never seen that. As far as I know, no one is. The only ones that could potentially still be here, which is a whole nother prophetic conversation, would be Enoch and Elijah are potentially not dead here on Earth at the fringes of the Earth somewhere in the Antarctic or something like that. That's a whole nother talk. But Noah, it's written that he's 600 years old when the flood occurs. Well, is that true or is it not? Right? And <clears throat> that's before we even get to any cosmology. Do you believe the ages that are in the Bible? Adam is 930 years old when he dies. Is that true? <laughs> right? It, Methuselah is even older. Is that 964, true? 964, right? 964. Right? Yeah, right? exactly. Almost 1,000 years old. Noah's living for 600 years. It, and longer. He lives longer. This is the flood. He's, he's not dead yet. It, is it true? And, the, and this is what everything comes down to. Are we going to believe our eyes? Are we going to believe our experience? Or are we going to believe the word of God first and foremost? And then our eyes will see it eventually, but way before our eyes see it. In fact, Hebrews 11.1 1 says that that's what faith is. It says that faith is confident expectation, being sure that it's done while unseen. That's it. I'm, I'm translating the Greek more literally. When you open yeah. it, it's going to say something else but but it literally hope means expectation so confident expectation and then that word uh things is actually the word pragma in greek and it means it's done so you're sure that it's done while unseen so i'm sure that this happened though i haven't seen it that noah was 600 years old okay what else 17th day of the month the same day uh, were all the fountains of the great deep broken up well that means there are great deep fountains down below us that literally pushed additional water up onto the earth. And what we found, and Josh, maybe you've seen this. I don't know if everybody watching has seen it. They can go look for it. Um, we've sent submarines to extreme depths and found essentially vents where you can see eels swimming in and out, like life swims in and out. But the submarine cannot descend further. Whatever's going on there, the water pressure is too tremendously high it's catastrophically high it cannot descend it can't even start to touch into it it's just it just cannot go into it and these are enigmatic uh pools of water it, it literally looks like a pool of water underwater it's it's actually very strange and bizarre to behold well those are literally the fountains of the great deep that the scriptures talk about existing they do exist <laughs> and, and then the windows of heaven were opened well again with the firmament and and that that uh, design there are literally doors that poured water in so we had we had water coming from extremely deep levels of the ocean from vents in extremely deep levels and then we had doors open in the firmament dropping water in it wasn't just merely rain there was rain right that's what it says in verse 12 and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights there was rain but a huge portion of the water that was coming in was coming in from falling from above through fountains and coming from beneath through fountains. So, so just in one verse, there's a whole different world here than, than what NASA has taught. So do we believe it? Do we believe that the earth was completely flooded? I absolutely think so. They, they, they try and tell us that, oh, the Grand Canyon, you know, is a million years old. But the Grand Canyon looks like a lot of water that was rushing off of land away from land and then of course was eventually reabsorbed into the great deep okay so a lot of these phenomena that we witness is not as old as what they say 
they're always lying. First off, God's an artist, so he can design things to look old if he'd like or what have you. Uh, he's an artist. Um, I don't think Adam was a little baby. He made him aged. And so he can make things aged, even though they're brand new. Like Adam's first day might have looked like a 30-year-old. Why? Because God can make things aged if he'd like. Um, so that's the first thing. But two, uh, they always use carbon dating for everything. And carbon breaks down at different rates under different conditions. And it's really a scam and a joke. Uh, it, it's not a reliable dating system uh, by any standard of measure, unless you're dating something within the last few centuries, then it might be something that'll work. But even then, if it was in a frozen environment or a lava environment, that's going to change the, the breakdown of that. So do we believe that the earth actually was flooded regardless of evidence? That's really what this boils down to. Like, I'm all for evidence. I've been presenting evidence. We've been presenting evidence this whole time. However, this is ultimately going to come down to, do you believe what God's word says? Because you will not always have visible evidence for the things that are written you're going to need to trust god that he is speaking the truth to you without having seen it you eve didn't need to have seen death first to believe god when he said if you eat the fruit you'll die and yet she did she relied on her eyes and her eyes had never seen death so she disbelieved what god said and look now we're all dying now we've all seen plenty of death we didn't need to see it to know that it was true Right? I would have preferred never seeing it. I think everybody agrees. And so now we need to just believe God. Yes, the earth flooded. Noah was 600 years old. There are events in the firmament. There are events way down deep. And they released a bunch of water. And everyone died except for Noah and, and his family. That's, that's it. Yeah. And Noah was saved not because he was righteous, but because he was a man of faith. He was righteous by faith. He trusted what God said. He trusted that there was a God. He trusted God when God said he was going to flood the earth. He trusted God that he needed to build an ark, so he did. He trusted God. He no one never saw an earth flood, a cataclysmic earthwide flood in his life. He'd never seen anything like that, but he believed God, and that's why he was a righteous man, not because he was sinless, but because he believed God. So this is really important. The, the story of Noah and Noah's faith is so tremendously important. We need to, like Noah, believe God before our eyes see it. That's what this all comes down to. It is true. You'll see it with your eyes someday, but even if you don't see it in this lifetime, it doesn't really matter. The word of God is still true. Yes, sir. And uh, if you think about this, if everybody's on earth, the fountains of the great deep were broken. And if you have a uh, an ark, since they're broken from the bottom up, the first thing that happens is the fountains of the great deep were broken. So what's going to happen is Noah's going to be lifted up off the earth as the fountains of the great deep were open. And then this is a massive amount of water coming in with the fountain. If the windows of heaven were open, the water would come in rushing. So it's going to basically just fill up and then his ark is going to be safe. It's going to be pushed up. Right. So I yep. think we need to understand that literally what's happening. And then it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, every time I hear pastors teach on this, I hear them saying, well, the windows of heaven were open means that it started raining. But there's three separate events they're not talking about. They do talk about the fountains of the great deep being broken, but they never put emphasis on the windows of heaven being open. They just say that's what that's just a metaphor for it is starting to rain. Then why would no, God it's say separate that? from the rain? Yeah, that's, that's what I'm a saying. Good point. It's, it's a separate it's from the rain, right? It's separated from the rain. You're yeah. so right. That's three, a good point. Three events, right? And I think it even the way that it even happened, it says the fountains of the great deep were broken. Uh, then the windows of heaven were open. Then it rained 40 days and 40 nights. And then exactly. he did it reverse. He closed the fountains of the great deep. He closed the windows of heaven. And then it stopped raining. So, and then he, he sent a great wind to, you know, and, and it was 150 days until the water went down. So we got to yep. understand, man, it's, it's like when you read the Bible in, in the way that we, we understand it literally, and that's a good point. You got to believe the ages too. That that's a really good point, man, that, that people don't all understand, of it. you know, all and, of it, all of it. It, it. We don't even, you know, I, I saw something you had posted. Um, when you look at somebody at church and they also believe, you know, Genesis six or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The look on the face. So, yeah. yeah. So yeah, the, the Bible talks about angels fallen angels coming to earth having sex with human women and producing a demonic half human half angel race called the nephilim like do we believe that that has nothing to do with cosmology <laughs> did that happen yes it did happen it doesn't matter that my eyes didn't see it in fact since we were talking about noah i pulled up hebrews 11 7 because hebrews 11 is essentially the faith chapter of hebrews and it says this and this is what i was talking about when i said our eyes cannot be what we base things off of 
Verse 7, by faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. In other words, <clears throat> Noah is righteous not because he's sinless. None of us are sinless. It's just God's affection that we call grace. His affection, he just charitably gives us gifts simply because he recognizes we're sheep who have been deceived. He's kind to the ungrateful and wicked. That's who he is. It's good to know that's who he is. <laughs> you know, we're all on borrowed time. He's given us more time to come to repentance. That's what he's done. And he sent his son. In fact, the scriptures say, if he did not spare his own son, how will he not along with him graciously give us all things? He's the giver. He loves us. Okay, so how is Noah righteous? He believes God's warning. He believes his word. Before he sees it, he'd never seen anything like it. Nobody had ever seen anything like it. In fact, the scriptures also indicate that Noah was a preacher of righteousness, which the book of Jasper gets into him preaching to people on earth. The Bible actually doesn't. So it's interesting that it says that. That starts to point us back to, you know, reading some of these extra Hebrew texts um, just to understand the history. Even if, like you said at the beginning, even if they're not divine scripture, uh, they're often referenced when you when you get to know them. And something that the New Testament says is that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Well, in Genesis, he doesn't preach to nobody. Mm -hmm. and, and we don't see him preach to anybody anywhere written in the Protestant Bible. And so we know that he actually ministered to people. And in the book of Jasher, it says that he and Methuselah went around, I think it was 120 years. They went around for over a century preaching that the flood was coming and to turn and believe God. In other words, God was willing to save anyone who had believed, not just Noah, but only Noah would believe. And that tells you something about the state of man. We're in such a state of wickedness and unbelief that God is telling us exactly what's coming, willing to save us, willing to put us on an ark. And we're saying, no, no, no. I, I think we're going to go land on Mars one day. I think, I think that Jesus was not real. I don't think he resurrected. I, you know, all whatever it is, you know, and so we're just not believing. Uh, and yet our eyes are deceiving us. We're trusting our eyes and our eyes are liars. You, if Satan appeared <clears throat> and did some kind of um, deceptive work that your eyes could see, that doesn't make it true. Uh, if you've ever been to a magician show, you know how easy it is for your eyes to be totally deceived, totally deceived by what you're seeing. You're watching it with your own eyes. And it looks like this person just got sawed in half. They didn't. Now, whether you know that or not, your eyes are lying to you. You're going to have to believe something other than your eyes to know that the magician is lying to you. And that's what Satan is. He's a magician. He's just, he's lying. The whole thing's a lie. You got Noah. By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet. That's the KJV. The NASB says, being warned of God by things not yet seen. Things that no eye had ever seen. God said, this is going to happen. And only Noah believed. And everybody else is not believing. So the question for you, viewers, is, are you going to be a believer? Are you going to trust God? Are you going to listen to the Holy Spirit pulling at your heart to trust him? Yes, with cosmology. Yes, with his Messiah. Yes, with his commandments, with everything. Are you going to exit Satan's kingdom, which is Egypt? And are you going to enter the promised land, the true kingdom, the kingdom of God? Because Jesus said in the Gospels, he said, the kingdom is in your midst. What does that mean? It means that Satan's kingdom and God's kingdom are literally coexisting in our midst right here. And you can be in one or the other. And most are in Satan's kingdom. Yeah. Unbeknownst to them, they're in Satan's kingdom. How do you exit right now into God's kingdom? Believe on his son, which the son's been prophesied throughout the Psalms and Proverbs in the Old Testament as well. So you believe on his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. It doesn't say whoever's seen him. It says whoever would believe in him, believe what he has done, believe what he has said. That person would be saved. And then from there, begin to believe all of it. Believe everything. Like if you're hearing us talk about cosmology and the Holy Spirit's pulling at you that God exists and that he loves you and that he gave his son, believe that. Believe that truth. 
and, 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 and if you're hearing about Noah and you're hearing about these people of faith who believe what they haven't seen, that's God compelling you. He will not force you, but he will compel you to be like them, to, to imitate them, to have faith like they had in their time. Right now, we're in the same case. The scriptures say that, that as in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. There will be a heavy amount of unbelief and wickedness. And at the same time, the kingdom of God is actually increasing in wisdom and in faith. And so we're inviting you and the Holy Spirit is inviting you to come into the love of God, to believe in Jesus Christ, to believe that he died on the cross for your sins, for your sickness and for your death, and that God raised him from the dead and that you too will be given a resurrected body in the new heaven and the new earth. It's it's good news. I mean, I'm excited good about news. the millennial kingdom. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm, I'm so glad. I mean, I've read the beginning of the book. I've read the end of the book. I've read the middle of the book. And the beginning and the ending are the two best parts because in Eden, there's no suffering. And in the new heaven and new earth, there's no suffering. That tells you that's God's ultimate will for us. Even if we get a little confused in the interim, the, the ultimate will of God for us is no sickness, no death, no suffering, just enjoying his affection and having affection for one another. God loves us and we're to love each other. Hallelujah. Amen. And how was it in the days of Noah? Just so we'll go over that before we end. We're, we're getting real close to the end here. Um, then the Lord God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that yep. every intent of the thoughts in his heart was evil continually. And the yep. Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man who I, whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Grace. And, and also, how much grace is he showing you if he's having Noah preach and preach and preach and everybody's not believing? Yep. There's all these men yep. that are great men that are preaching, 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 and those that are not believing. It's like, man, like you said, belief is, is so important and and what yeah. happens is they, they want that's what ha that Satan wants you to do. Filter the Bible through science. That's what he wants you to do because science is a great lie. He wants, you know, not yeah. all science. I'm talking about pseudoscience. You know, it's a great lie. So you filter it through and then you're like, okay, I can't, I, I'm going to take this one literally, not believe this. Take this literally, not believe this. So you're even the gospel itself, exactly what you're talking about, Josh, is occurring with the gospel message itself. So in the New Testament, Isaiah chapter 53 is referenced as being the gospel no less than seven times. And in verse four, we always translate that surely it was our uh, griefs that he himself bore and our, and our uh, sorrows he carried. In Hebrew, those words are sickness and pain. We translate them correctly in Matthew chapter eight, verse 17. So what I mean by that is even down to the gospel, people are teaching that Jesus only bore sin. This is not true. He bore sin. He bore sickness. He bore pain. He bore death. There are four There are four human events that Jesus bore on the cross, and he literally experienced all of them. That's what the scriptures indicate. He experienced all of it on the cross, literal death, literal sickness, literal sin in his body. He dies, and then we're offered resurrection. How many preachers even, even believe that now, right? Because we've watched people die of sickness. So then we start going, oh, well, it must be that Jesus didn't bear our sicknesses. He absolutely did. We're to believe. That's how we even receive things. We, we don't go off of our eyes. If you use your eyes, you're going to go, well, God heals some and he forgives some and he doesn't. No, no, no. Everyone is given this, but it's received by belief and unbelief. You could believe him for forgiveness of sin and not for healing. You could believe him on this topic and not that one, right? You could believe him for provision and not for generosity. And so you're really provided for, but you're also super greedy, right? Because you just, you're not having faith. And Hebrews 3.12, kind of as a, a wrap up, this is really where we started, you know, on this idea of belief and unbelief. Uh, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 says, take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. In other words, it's this unbelieving heart that leads to the fall. It's this using the eyes and listening to the serpent instead of to the words of God. And so I believe that's what the Holy Spirit wants for all of us. I mean, that this goes for me as much as anybody to believe every word that, yeah. that, that God yeah. has said, because he is the truth. Jesus said, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Yes. Thank you, man. Now, this is this was an amazing episode. And, 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 it, and we, we take it back to what people need to understand. Um, we're Amen. saved by grace, right? Through faith, uh, for it is not of yourselves, it is a gift from God, uh, so Amen. that no man shall boast. So what is the devil going to do? 
He's going to say, you're saved by grace. You're going to always have grace. People know that from God. But that faith part is what he's going to attack. He's like, this is he my main exactly. area to attack. Yeah. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. You're not able to hear when you go through the hall of fame of faith. You hear all these men. I look at Eli Elijah. Look at uh, Enoch. They walked with God, obeyed God. And what happens? They ascended to heaven. Or maybe like you said, maybe they're, I don't know. I think they ascended to heaven. Uh, I think they went up to heaven. And 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 that's what happens. And, and also the righteousness of, of Noah is important. The generations and genealogy of Noah was also important. So the flood didn't happen just because every man was wicked, but also, you know, the DNA got corrupted by fallen angels. It's a, it's a, this, the Bible comes alive as you start yeah. recognizing these things that we're talking about. When it comes alive to you, it comes alive better than any motion picture, any film, anything you're ever. So much in. better because the Bible is so much better than Avengers. The, the, yeah, the Holy Spirit <laughs> is 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 gonna indwell in you, and you're gonna find out like, wow, this is literally the Word of God, which it is. And just for for example, we need to pay attention to the fact that we're able to actually read it in all different languages, in all different variations of how the Bible is written. Right. We get to go back to the strong concordance, go back to the Hebrew, go back to the Greek, we need to go back all these different things. So what's our excuse when Jesus says, you know, you cast out demons in my name, but I never knew you because you didn't have the faith built to believe him fully. You know, you might have thought you did, but it's like you got to understand the Bible fully in context from Genesis to Revelation, you know, the beginning to the end. So I appreciate, man, this is a, I think this is a beautiful, beautiful episode. I appreciate you, Rich. And I knew it was going to be a smasher, but if, if you don't mind, um, I, I would like to have you back on and maybe we can go into that Isaiah and everything you were kind of going to and kind of put a microscope when you're talking about, you know, um, the gospel, man, we could, we could do that. And I think you did a great message sure. on that. If you could share that with us at, uh, at some oh, point. Oh, of course. I, I, I'd be delighted. I, I, that's, you know, I think that's the follow-up to cosmology is Jesus. It, it, in fact, that's literally the order in the Bible. So Genesis 1 is God made the heavens and the earth, right? And then Genesis 3 is God sent the Messiah. So, and we got deceived by a serpent. The gospel is literally the power of God to save people. And part of preaching the gospel, I, I actually affirm this now, is Romans 1. It's, it's pointing to creation, right? There's a God. Okay, now let's talk about his Messiah that he sent to save us from this serpent that we made our father through unbelief. See, if you're not agreeing with God as the true king, then you're agreeing with the serpent. So he becomes your master and Lord. And he is a jailer and a torturer. He's, he's terrible. That's why we all end up suffering so much. Just because, yeah, here's sin. It's going to feel good. And then he's like, all right, now I have a legal right to destroy you. And that's his whole thing. And God's like, hey, if you'll just believe me, I'll completely save you from that serpent that has deceived you. So it's an amazing gift that God has given us through Jesus. So yeah, I'd love yes. to come on and talk about the gospel. And, and even on my channel, I have a lot of my recent sermons I've been talking about, you know, what the full complete gospel really is. And I do bring up cosmology periodically. In fact, my recent sermon, Tabitha, I talked about cosmology and how it should um, excite us that there's a God, not discourage us that there's a lying serpent. You know, everybody gets focused on NASA and the government lying. Yeah. I actually don't care about that. That stuff's passing away. I'm glad that. that there's a creator, right? There's God exists. And so I am on my way to him by believing in his son. And that's great news. That's the good news of the gospel. So, you know, yeah. if anything, we should be excited that there's a rakia over our heads and that God sent his son to die on the cross and resurrect three days yes. later for all of our salvation. And Jesus does talk about in uh, Lazarus where you pass away on um, the rich man, the poor man. So you pass away, the angels immediately come and get you and you become yeah. spirit. So you're able to go through the firmament and go to heaven or your spirit where you could go into the earth where hell is located, which I showed you on that biblical cosmology screen. So we need to understand that it's all beautiful. And, and the message came through uh, definitely great. So uh, since you're a pastor, you can end us in prayer. Usually I pray, but yeah, if, if you don't mind ending this in prayer, uh, I would definitely appreciate it, brother. Sure, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together uh, using technology. We thank you for the Gutenberg Press that gave us the Bible uh, being mass produced for humanity. And we thank you for cameras uh, and the ability to meet with one another across the earth. Um, and Lord, I pray that all those who have listened to this would be encouraged in the faith, that their faith would increase as a result of hearing your word, that they would believe you regarding cosmology, that they would believe you regarding your son, that they would believe you with prophecy, with commandments, with all things. 
you've created us, created us to be loved by you and to show love to our neighbors. And Lord, I ask that you'd help all people who are within the Flat Earth Movement to remember that those who are under the spell of the devil are not their enemies, that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers of darkness, that we're actually wrestling with the serpent and his lies and his unbelief, and that we want to pull people out of that unbelief. We ask that your Holy Spirit would give us the words to share with people, that we would not let our flesh and emotions get in the way, that we would not become angry with others, but that we would look at them with compassion and that we would share the truth of your word with them and the truth of the gospel with them. And ultimately that they would be saved, even if they don't yet believe regarding cosmology, that they would believe in your son and that they would continually grow in faith to the point of believing everything that you have said. And Lord, I pray that you would bless Josh and his podcast and that he would continue to have favor and blessing as he shares your word boldly online. We thank you for this opportunity to gather in Jesus name. Amen. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you, everybody that's listening. Uh, can you can you please uh, tell the audience where they could find you, where they could find your sermons, where they could find all this the the awesome energy you have and the beautiful stuff you have online? Yeah, youtubecom slash Rich Tidwell. You can find pretty much all my sermons there. Um, I also have a local church. You can go to ormondchurch.net and visit us when you're in the Daytona Beach area. We're in Florida, so anytime you're in the area, I actually do have people that find me online that when they happen to vacation to Florida, they come visit us at the church. So love to meet you in person and uh, it, it'd be awesome. great to see you. But yeah, youtube.com slash Rich Tidwell. I'm also on TikTok at Rich Tidwell. I'm, I'm on Facebook and Instagram uh, as well. It's all Rich Tidwell. It's usually pretty easy to find. Yes. And uh, if you could uh, send me via Instagram, those, those links, so I could put, post them below. Yes. Yeah, I will. This yeah. is going to be coming out next week, Rich. And if you want to post this on your channel, your YouTube or anywhere you want to post this, it's free. You know, you can do whatever you want with it. No awesome. Problem. Yeah. If, if you can send me the uh, video, that'd be great. I will. I'll send you the video. So everybody that's listening, thank you so much. Please go subscribe to his YouTube, uh, his Instagram, uh, TikTok. You know, it just helps him out uh, to be able to share the word, God's word with you. Uh, whenever you listen to stuff and you understand you're going to learn new things. Uh, I've gone over Hebrew cosmology before, but there's so much new stuff that was brought forth for you guys. And, and that's what we do. We just keep on nailing it out so that you guys understand the, the end from the beginning. You understand the beginning from the end, you know, and then you'll understand everything in the Bible. Your, your foundation will be solid, biblical, instead of scientific. And then you will understand what's going on with the Messiah coming and why everything even happened in the first place. So Thank you guys for listening. We love you. Please share the podcast if you can and give us five-star review and also share his uh, sermons as well. Thank you guys and God bless you.